The content herein is for informational purposes only, not intended as medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, and is not to be substituted for direct advice from your doctor. Today's LymphCast program is proudly sponsored by Vita Support MD, the makers of Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000. These MPFF-based nutraceuticals are backed by science and recommended by doctors specializing in venous and lymphatic disorders. Visit VitaSupportMD.com to learn more. Greetings and welcome to our LymphCast show, episode 61. How about that? Every single episode is in podcast land, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you go for podcasts, you can find us. And every episode is on YouTube. If you want to see what we look like yet again, go to YouTube and all 61 episodes are there as well. We invite you to check out our website all of the time, multiple times a week. That's lymphcastnetwork.com. And if you have a question for one of the doctors, you can email us at hello at lymphcastnetwork.com. Let's go around the table and meet the panel and get this thing going. Our regular panel is with us tonight from California, Dr. Emily Eicher. Hello, Dr. Eicher. How are you? Thank you, Paul. All is well. And welcome, our wonderful team. It's so great to join you. All right. Very good. Thank you for being here. From Arizona, Dr. Monica Glavitsky. Hello, Dr. Glavitsky. How are you? Hi, everybody. Thank you, Paul, for uh, introducing us. And uh, I'm happy to be with you after a couple of episodes of the absence from, uh, from myself as I was traveling all around the world. That's right. We are glad that you are back. As Dr. Chuback used to say, the Beatles are back together. So here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Dr. Chuback, the gentleman who started this whole show, even before it started, he had the idea. He's also the founder and owner of Vita Support MD. He's an author. He's an entrepreneur, physician, surgeon from New Jersey, Dr. John A. Chuback. Hello, Dr. Chuback. How are you? Fine, Paul. Thank you. Looking forward to this evening's show. Absolutely. And through your Vita Support MD, you make Vein Formula 1000, Lymphatic Formula 1000. And if you don't mind, just take a moment. How can our listeners get a hold of that tonight? They could simply go to vitasupportmd.com and uh, all the information is there. And hopefully many of their physicians across the country are now carrying it in their in their offices as well. Okay. And I think the last time we talked, you mentioned they can also get it from Amazon if, if that's their that's place true. of choice. Okay. Yes. Yes. That's another easy place to get it. All right. Very good. Let me turn it back to you then, Dr. Chuback, if you want to bring our special guest in and we'll get the questions going. Sure. Today's guest is uh, Cynthia Schechter. And uh, I've known Cynthia for some time here in the uh, northern New Jersey um, area practicing as uh, colleagues. Cynthia is the uh, owner and director of rehabilitation at Schechter Care. And um, she has an undergraduate degree in sociology from Ithaca College, and she has her master's degree in occupational therapy from NYU. And uh, as I said, we've worked together uh, closely over the last uh, several years. And um, her practice is uh, dedicated mostly to breast cancer and lymphedema rehabilitation. And one of the things that I know that Cindy's passionate about is um, tailoring her care on an individual basis, patient to patient, and not applying um, strict rules um, to each individual. And that's probably something we will talk about today. She had a um, beautiful practice in Midtown Manhattan, Madison Avenue for many years, and has since, we're very fortunate here in the uh, suburbs of New York City to have her now in um, Emerson, New Jersey at Schechter Care. So without uh, any further ado, I'd like to spend most of our time speaking with Cynthia and getting her perspectives and her her wisdom on many of these important subjects that we'll touch on. So Cynthia Schechter, welcome to the LymphCast podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Wonderful. Great I, I know that you have uh, met Dr. Emily Eicher in the past, at least over the telephone, maybe at, at meetings as well. And I know that Emily was just touching on um, a subject you may or may not know that much about, because I know it's slightly outside of your wheelhouse, but it's a good way to get the ball rolling, I think. What are your thoughts on um, lymphedema and lipedema in, in children, let's say uh, prepubescent age? I think it is clearly underdiagnosed. I think a lot of 
parents are told that their children have to lose weight or that they have some sort of an issue. They go to a thyroid physician, they go to endocrinology, but they're never actually on the right path. I do see a lot of people that are outside of my wheelhouse because a lot of other clinicians won't. And I don't really believe in leaving someone struggling. So I have a tendency to see pretty much anyone. Um, And I think that children, lymphedema and lipedema combined are both completely under addressed in the medical profession. So anything that we could do to bring light to it, to show that there is actually a problem. Um, I actually have a new patient now who has lipedema. She's had it her whole life and everybody told her to lose weight. She lost approximately a hundred pounds and she has lipedema. So unfortunately she has lipedema and it doesn't just go away from weight loss. And I think it's important that people understand that it's not, I've even had physicians send me messages. Is it just a fat condition? No, it's, it's not, well, it's a condition and it's related to fatty tissue, but it's not a fat condition. It's not that you go on a diet and it goes away. And sometimes I don't even think that the doctors believe me. So it's much, it's so important. And in children, we all know they live a difficult life to begin with. Peers are difficult and then they have a problem and that's all that they hear about. And there's teasing and there's a lot of things that we can do to educate the families, educate the children themselves so that they could actually self-advocate and speak on their own behalf so that if they are being spoken to or about and teased, then they have something to say because they actually have a clinical issue as opposed to anything other. And it would be wonderful if that was something that was addressed. I know that a lot of kids that I've met have been gone underdiagnosed because it isn't something that a lot of pediatricians aren't in touch with. And so their condition worsens because it's not identified, so it's not treated. And then there's a lot of very young children that then can't find care because people don't treat pediatrics. So it's a whole mess of an issue. And I think the more the awareness that we can bring to it, the better off it'll be for the whole community. Fantastic. I'm going to ask one more question before I throw it over to the rest of the panel and we get the conversation really rolling. And it's it's interrelated in the sense that I know one of your areas of great interest and expertise is lymphedema of the upper extremity after breast cancer and treatments, various treatments for breast cancer. And again, I feel like we agree that there's an under-recognition, under-diagnosis, under-treatment of upper extremity lymphedema now because I'm old enough to remember the old days of uh, mod- uh, modified radical mastectomies and so forth, where numerous lymph nodes were being taken from the uh, underarm area, what we call the axilla. And lymphedema was, in some cases, quite quite dramatic in those days. And as surgical treatments and techniques have improved, I think we're seeing less of it, but not none. And why don't you share with us and with the with the listeners and the viewers what your feelings are about how well uh, upper extremity lymphedema after breast cancer is being diagnosed and managed? I think physicians are more likely to at least listen to a patient who says that their sleeve is a little bit tighter on one side. They'll at least send them for an evaluation or do something, right? So they'll, I get referrals. Um, Do I think that physicians are always completely aware of what's going on with the patient? No. And the one thing that I think is the most undiagnosed is early onset lymphedema or subclinical lymphedema, which can be an aching down the extremity. It can just be a heavy feeling and you don't actually have a circumferential measurement that shows something any different than the other side. But it doesn't mean that they're not having subclinical symptoms. And if we could address everybody in their subclinical state, we could probably reverse the lymphedema. I've worked with people who have had a complete reversal but they need to be referred early. To me, I just think that it's not so much that doctors don't 
know about it. I think everybody knows about it. I think a lot of people like to say that the sentinel biopsies have alleviated the issue. But I mean, it really depends on the person's body. And there are a lot of people on my program who have full-blown lymphedema and had a sentinel node biopsy. So, but then they had a lumpectomy, then they were radiated. All of these things affect the lymphatics. And I think that there's a lack of attention to that. So the radiation oncologist sees someone maybe once every two weeks, and they're not necessarily looking for a swelling condition developing. They're looking at people's skin to make sure it's not blistered. And does that make sense? A hundred percent. But unfortunately, a lot of people think that their arm is just supposed to be uncomfortable. And they think that that's how it is for the rest of their life. And I think that's really sad. Um, there are still people who say that they can't lift enough weight to carry their baby. And women are getting breast cancer in their early 30s through their 40s, and they have young children. And telling them that they can't pick them up or something because that's going to put them at risk is really, it's it's a life-altering, parenting-altering situation. And the idea that we would say that to someone and just have it be a blanket statement, it must be so depressing to be that patient who is actually told, yeah, no, somebody will have to hand you your child. So what happens when you're in the park and your kid falls off a swing? You're going to go over and you're going to pick up your child. So my job is to make sure that that doesn't cause an issue. So I almost wish that if I had my druthers in the medical profession, every single patient who goes through breast cancer surgery should be referred for therapy whether it's a lumpectomy, whether it's a mastectomy, whether it's an axillary node dissection or a sentinel node biopsy, the sooner we can address things like scar tissue, radiation, radiation fibrosis, or even mild swelling and axillary web, the sooner we can actually get people better. Instead of waiting for somebody to come and present with a problem, we could actually do things preventively. And that's sort of my big push with the medical profession. Does it work? Not really. I think 50% of the time people will be referred early. I I think that every single patient who goes through surgery should get at least a two-week stint of therapy to make sure that they get their range of motion back, to make sure that they're not scarring, to make sure that they have an exercise program, and then things will be identified. And They might not be identified by the physician, but it'll be identified by me. I communicate with the physician and it'll increase awareness all around. So I think that, yeah, is there a lack of understanding or recognition? Sure. But I also think there's a lot of things that we have that we use as diagnostic tools that don't test positive until someone actually has excess fluid and we shouldn't have to wait that long. As soon as someone says that their arm is aching, there's a reason. And usually it's that subclinical onset. So does that answer? Mm -hmm. I I think it's fascinating because I just had this uh, discussion with the... uh, I, uh, Majan Nazaleska, the, uh, the, our friend who was working with Professor Olszewski on, uh, on the the issue of lymphedema. And she Mm -hmm. presented the, uh, the results uh, testing, you know, the um, women after uh, a breast cancer surgery and found actually exactly what you are saying, that even, you know, like long before the onset of the uh, lymphedema per se, you know, the visible lymphedema, they, ha- they have already the changes in, the, in their uh, tissue that, mm-hmm. uh, that are visible and then you might have actually the, the better test to detect them. But uh, I, I truly believe that the, uh, the uh, wonderful proposal would be just to have a preventive therapy. Yes. And now they're referring people pre-op so that you can do measurements and you could do a ton of different things, but then they don't refer them post-op. So because... I guess because they don't see any swelling to me. I mean, honestly, a woman has a mastectomy. They're cutting, they're, they're cutting off part of their chest. They go to raise their arm overhead and they're petrified. It's going to open a wound so they don't move. And then they have range of motion that goes to about here. And we're saying, Oh, why do I have lymphatic blockage? Well, I mean, 
because you can't even move, hon, it's not your fault. Let's work on it. We'll get you better. But it shouldn't get to that point, right? Everybody should be able to have somebody that can help them through the process. It's sort of like most people who have a knee replacement have to go for PT to get their range of motion back, right? I mean, it's not really that much different. I think it should really be a direct referral. So to me, if it should be like almost like the stroke programs that exist in hospitals, where every single patient who has even a TIA is evaluated by OT and PT in acute care so that they can make sure that everybody is completely functional, no sensory deficits, the whole thing. I think why don't we follow that? They're already doing things preemptively, just not for this community. And I never understand why. I think if we worked on the scar tissue, certainly there's going to be better fluid flow. I mean, of course, there's going to be changes in the tissue. And if people are complaining of something, nine times out of 10, there's a reason. Most patients, after they go through breast cancer treatment, are not looking for reasons to complain. They've been through chemo. They've been through surgeries. They've been through reconstruction. They've been through radiation. They don't want to complain. But so if they are, we should really be listening to them. I mean, I listen to everybody, but I'm just a rehab therapist. So it, it's not the same. I don't hear from them. And I'm at a private practice. So I won't know what's going on at the hospital unless someone contacts me. A lot of patients now are actually reaching out on their own because they're a lot more educated because of podcasts like this. But if things like this didn't exist, then what? And it's it's really unfortunate. It seems that of course, especially if somebody did a study and the tissue actually demonstrates that there's a change, then isn't that just more proof that why don't we have a protocol where it's an immediate referral? It's not a blemish to a doctor that a patient needs rehab, certainly not with any other surgery and certainly not with that. So it makes so much more sense. Agreed. Emily, what are, you, what are your thoughts on what Cynthia said about the, the hands-on therapy, et cetera, for, for scar tissue? I, I think it's very important. Absolutely important. And I want to compliment you that you are advocating and spreading the, the word that the patient should be seen immediately after surgery. And I would go even further, see patients before surgery. Mm -hmm. and do, I uh, use a lot of ultrasound studies, and it would be ideal to do ultrasound before surgery and ultrasound after surgery. But here are the issues. Uh, issues is with billing, issues with Medicare, H how you're going to document that you want to do preoperatively and uh, assess what diagnosis you're going to put down. And then the insurances may not comply with what you want to do for this patient and deny your wonderful work. So th there are a lot of issues, but I think... Look, we are so much better than we used to be 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Even now, physicians are aware of lymphedema. And I think compliments to women who really opened the door for lymphedema awareness because of the breast cancer and consequences after breast cancer surgery. So right. much, much better with that. And uh, I think ideally would be to see the patients before assess the measurements, whatever measurements, uh, uh, whatever tools you have in your facility. And as I said, I do the ultrasound studies and we see the changes in early phase of lymphedema where the fascia is completely different. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I just saw a patient today with early onset of lymphedema, although it was after uh, rectal cancer and radiation treatments, and you have bifurcation of the fascia, which that's not normal, and no. thinning of the fascia. And so, and uh, we need to spread the awareness of the early onset of lymphedema and how to treat the lymphedema and how to do uh, even myofascial relief for yes. these patients. Because you can do manual lymph drainage, fine, but you can do compression. But certain aspects of uh, differences in a fascia, you can only detect on ultrasound. 
and it correlates with clinical presentation. Yes. And you could palpate. So like there's certain areas of the extremity where certainly you find more fibrotic tissue. The ulnar ridge is like a magnet for it. But a lot of people actually say that oh, they, she doesn't have any pitting at the ulnar ridge. I was like, are you sure you pressed? Because it's there. It's thick. The tissue's thick. If the tissue's thick, you press a little harder. You'll find it. And if you don't, is it brawny? Because you're either going to have a lot of malleability of that tissue or you're going to have no malleability of that tissue or you fall somewhere in the spectrum. I think most people fall in the spectrum and I'm not a feather touch kind of person. I think I come across personality wise, like I couldn't be a feather touch kind of person. Um, I don't, I don't think it really works. And I, I, I don't think I actually have the capacity to have a feather touch. I think I have to actually work on the tissue. Uh, but I also want to be able to feel what's going on underneath the fluid. And if you don't break any of that up and you get rid of the fluid, you still leave someone with a very uncomfortable extremity. And I'm glad you brought up somebody with rectal cancer because people with ovarian, uterine, cervical, anal, rectal, um, they they all have surgeries, they're radiated, they also have surgical sites, and they have terrible lymphedema and their leg is in a dependent position. So what can we do? And there's a lot that you could do. But when they come to you 10, 20 years after having lymphedema and scar tissue, it's a lot. It's not that you can't break up fibrotic scar tissue or tissue fibrosis. It just takes a ton of manual therapy, which is okay. There's also other techniques. There's other machines that have come out, but I prefer hands. I think that they work the best. I know what I'm feeling. I know how to change my pressures. And if I use a machine, I don't necessarily have that same ability. So I don't know why, but my hands sort of know what to do. And I've always said, I don't know. I don't think I'm really a genius. I think that my hands know what to do and I happen to own them. And I don't know why my hands know exactly how to work on someone. But every time they see me, they're like, you were amazing. Okay, I'm so glad. And if I wasn't, I'd hope you'd tell me because then I would change everything that I did to make it more effective. And that's where I sort of go with the flexibility but that tissue fibrosis is not reversible with nothing. So I agree. Compliments, compliments that you use your hands and you are combining it with your ex extreme knowledge that you have. Because a lot of patients that come through my door, they say, well, uh, the therapist said that she had such and such course and she barely touched me. And yes. so you cannot uh, improve. Thanks. A condition when when you have fibrotic tissue when you barely stroke the skin so yes. the expertise you have the knowledge and you have the years of experience that you know where to go and how how much to press but how many physicians don't even undress the patients don't touch the patients so right. we need to again spread the awareness of how important it is to send the patients to the right sources for treatment. And I agree. I'm so happy that you are, are telling the story about the efficacy of the uh, uh, manual treatment, um, because I think it's so um, um, underappreciated, and especially among the um, uh, medical um, uh, among the uh, the uh, physicians uh, that are not practicing it, that they know uh, little about the uh, the uh, this kind of therapies, and I just recently, you know, I had a whole animated discussion because uh, you have people using aggressive uh, compression therapy and having certainly excellent results. Uh, no problem, no question, and uh, uh, spreading the uh, uh, the news. Oh, you don't need anything else. So yeah. it, it's it's totally absurd because you can see almost with your uh, with the the uh, uh, knowing the uh, evolution of the disease that this patient 
after the uh, the aggressive compression treatment uh, applied by the physical therapist, of course, they will have a beautiful results, but they will go on uh, later and uh, will develop twice as big uh, mm -hmm. lymphedema because yeah. they will not come back for uh, this kind of treatment. Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000 from Vita Support MD are backed by science and sold in doctor's offices. If you're a physician who may be interested in prescribing or selling these excellent nutraceuticals, please call 862-246-7877 to speak to a representative today. Right, and there's no stimulation of new channels, new lymphatic channels, so they're really, I find, it's not that I don't wrap, I do, but I wrap for function. So I try not to use a ton of foam because nobody can move and people work. They need to be able to get dressed. They need to be able to go. I'm not a 24 hour mandated therapist. I'm somebody who definitely works with people with their lifestyle, with their work. I've had patients come to me in tears because they've been told at age 57 with children going to college, they have to change their career because they keep cutting themselves with a scissor because say they're a hairdresser. And I was like, you have to change your career. So are they going to send your kids to college? I don't understand. Why do you have to change your career? And I went through this whole, like, what do you do when you cut yourself? And do you wash your hands? Well, I could. Well, that's an excellent start. I mean, I think I would tell my child to do that, right? So, okay, wash your hands. Can you put pressure on your cut? Yes. Okay, great put pressure on it, stop the bleeding. You know what liquid Band-Aid is? Yes. Can you put it on there, let it dry before you go back and cut the hair? Of course I can. I have never seen the woman again. She calls me all the time to say, I can't believe it, but I don't have lymphedema. I just kept getting cellulitis. And I said, well, I mean, so you can live your life. We have to modify what we tell you based on what your life is. What do you do? What do you enjoy? We can't take everything away from someone because they're at risk of something. And you can't just bind an extremity and get some beautiful looking arm and not pay attention to what happens up at the shoulder. Because that's one of the things that really drives me a little bit bananas is when I look at people and they're like, look at how good I look. And they have their sleeve on and they have this beautifully thin arm and this donut around the top of their arm because nobody ever bothered to send the fluid to build lymphatic channels to try to actually resolve some of the issue and help the body recover. And that's one of the most important things, right, is we want the people to recover. We don't just want a skinny arm. And we certainly don't want a skinny arm with a big top. That's more upsetting. So like nobody wants overflow from their pants, let alone from their arm. And if they can't wear a sleeve all the time, is that really so terrible? No, they're getting a muscle pump. So the muscle pump is moving fluid. It's stimulating things. So what can we teach them? And there's a research nurse, Mei Fu, who I'm sure everybody's read about her, um, She's amazing, but she actually came up with this whole exercise regimen for people to do so that if they have subclinical lymphedema, you can actually give them these exercises and it facilitates lymphatic flow and you teach them and people do them. It's easy. They can do it. It doesn't seem like they're crazy. You do it on a plane. You do it wherever you are, whenever you have to get moving. And it actually has fascinating results just because of a muscle pump. Now, we know the reason we use short stretch bandages is to get a muscle pump. So I think that's a good idea. Like, it seems like it's so logical to me, but I maybe it's not. I mean, it's logical to us. I think people just have to start thinking a little bit outside of we get certified, but we were clinicians before we were certified in lymphedema therapy. So I was an OT practicing in a lot of different general medicine areas so that I could know a lot about different diagnoses. I like to know the science of it. I like to understand the body. But wouldn't it then make sense if you're going to be a specialist, you use your tools and you also use your lymphedema training, but you don't necessarily follow everything verbatim because, and I don't know where someone was trained to just do bandaging. And to say you don't need manual, but a lot of these therapists are also working at facilities that only book on the 10 minute. 
I convinced a facility in New Jersey when I worked for them back probably 18, actually 18 years ago when I had my son, um, I convinced them to give me a 30 minute session. I would have six hand patients sitting at the table. I would have three lymphedema patients in the clinic and the PTs would be standing there with their arms crossed and their patients would be working with the exercise physiologist. I was like, I must be doing something wrong here. I mean, (laughs) I'm very busy. What's happening? Like they're all just standing around. But what I realized is I'm just a very manual person. And I know that when people come to me, they don't just want me to fit them with a garment or stick a bandage on their arm. They're expecting to feel better when they leave. And honestly, I'm expecting to make them feel better. And if I don't, then the next session is going to be better because I'm always going to try to figure out what I didn't do. And I think a lot of us just sort of follow things and say, well, we're trained and this is what we were taught and this is what we do and it works, whether it does or not. And wouldn't it be great if everybody just actually evaluate, like I reevaluate someone every single time I see them. I reevaluate the tissue. I reevaluate the scar tissue. I reevaluate the cording. I reevaluate every single thing about them because everybody's body changes even one day to the next. So was I able to help? Did I make something worse? Are you in pain? You know, I think all of these things are important for us to pay attention to and not just that we're certified because if all we do is follow a certification, I mean, then all of the clinics that opened, like the learner clinic would still be open, right? Because he he moved people in, did a certain, I think it was a six week span of time that people were admitted to his facility, or they would go there twice a day, every day for six weeks, get treated, and then leave, but then they're discharged, and they don't have their tools. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you were saying, Dr. Iker, that they don't have the tools, they don't know what to do for certain things. So they don't, to me, Anything I don't know, I have to go learn. So, well, you know, I think this is, as always, I I enjoy our program so much, even though even though it was my idea, I don't enjoy it for that reason. I enjoy it because I always learn so much, and the and the the thing that I think everybody can see about Cynthia Schechter in listening to her and watching her is her really infectious and really sincere passion and enthusiasm for what she does. And if we had more of this in healthcare, I think our system would be a heck of a lot, a lot stronger. And the other thing that I love so much about the program, when I say how much I'm always learning, I mean, I hate to admit this, but when, when Cynthia says, well, everybody knows Mei Fu, the first thing I thought is, I don't know Mei Fu. And I just looked up Mei Fu and we're going to have to invite Mei Fu, who's a nurse. It looks like she's at the uh, uh, University of Missouri. Um, and we'd love to have her, yeah, Kansas City, on the program. But the enthusiasm, the passion, um, the the love for what you're doing is, is shining, is really, really shining through. And uh, as I said, we... We need more of that. And the conversation, we need to bring the conversation because the more we can talk to one another and in front of the public and with the public in sharing knowledge and about people, about techniques, I think it's fantastic. I want to I want to just comment on one thing that you that you said, Cynthia. And this brings me to my introduction at the beginning of the show, where I said how important it is for you to personalize treatment. And you know, Monica um, and her husband Peter have worked tirelessly um, in science, education, research. I'm trying to see if their latest book is in front of me. Somebody probably stole it from my office, but the fourth here it is. What's it wasn't me. <laughs> the fourth edition and the fifth edition, right on in front of me all the time. The reason I bring this up is because it brings guidelines, guidelines from the American Venus Forum for Venus disease and lymphatic disorders, okay? Mm -hmm. As hard as they've worked in looking at peer-reviewed science, at randomized controlled studies, at the best data possible in in rating guidelines as a 1A, a 1B, a 2A, 2B, 2C, the key word is guidelines. Mm -hmm. They're not laws. They're They're not rules. 
as you said. Now, they're very good guidelines, and I think people should be following evidence-based medicine to whatever extent mm -hmm. they can. But to your point about the patient who says, I'm going to change professions because of this or that, it reminds me of patients of mine that I have, let's say obesity is a huge problem in the country, okay? I have, I have male patients, I'll just use them as an example, I'm not picking on anybody, but male patients, let's say in their 60s, if I try to put them on some kind of new age diet with, you know, kale salad and lemon juice and, you know, not gonna happen. <laughs> kimchi. Now, if I could put them as an inpatient and force, you know, a locked inpatient unit and force them to eat it, they'd lose 50 pounds in, in eight weeks. But enough cabbage, eat, anybody would. They're not going to eat it. <laughs> so we give them advice on one slice of pizza instead of three or four, you know, yeah. drinking light beer rather than IPAs. Practical advice. Is it the best advice that I could possibly give? No, but it's advice that real people in the real world hopefully can live by and incorporate at least partially into their daily routine and their lifestyle, which will give them some benefit as opposed to strict and stringent regulations that feel oppressive and feel punitive that patients are going to reject and never yeah. follow. And if, if we do that, then we're not going to get anywhere with their with their care. Right. Yeah. They will not show it again. I'm sure, they will disappear. Soon. They disappear. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, to zero. One if any, right? that never come back either. <laughs> but you see, uh, being part of being a great cl clinician, and I talk, I, I try to talk sometimes to our young doctors, nurses, uh, therapists who who might tune into the show. Being a great clinician, a huge part of that goes back to what Cynthia Schechter said, listening, listening to the patient. And part of what you listen for is, who am I speaking to? What is this person's personality? Where, where do they come from philosophically? I know that there are patients, uh, there, there are plenty of uh, patients in my practice where I pr practice and so forth in a certain subset that I could get them on the kale salad with the with the lemon juice and the you know uh, ionized water and 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 so on and so forth. They'll go in all in for that five percent. But you have to be able to to determine who's in that five percent and who's the guy watching Monday night football, Sunday night football, Thursday night football, who likes his chicken wings and so forth. And can we get him to go first from fried chicken wings to baked chicken wings? Right. And could we get him to go from blue cheese dressing to low calorie, low fat blue cheese dressing on his chicken wings? So in listening to the patient, you not only make the diagnosis most of the times, you it helps you to plan an appropriate and reasonable treatment plan that is practical and applicable. Emily, Monica, what, what do you think about those ideas? First of all, I want to compliment Cynthia that you are not only treating an arm or a leg. You are treating a human, holistically, the entire human being. And you take into consideration what type of work do they have? How? Because many times patients come to me and they said, well, I can't stand this bandaging and I mm -hmm. cannot wash and I cannot do this and so on. And a lot of patients are driving long distance to get to Los Angeles area, to Santa Monica, where my clinic is. I, you know, when it's necessary and mm -hmm. then I do the bandaging when I consider that that would be ideal for the patient's problem. But when somebody's driving two hours, I will, un I will never bandage the leg when they have to be in, in a traffic for two hours. So it's, I wish- You're we the in the cutting off in the back of the knee. Absolutely. I wish we can clone you because you are one, you. Of a, one of a kind that you would- <laughs> Nobody's ever, I have to admit, nobody's ever wanted to clone me before. I should tell my husband. <laughs> amazing. Continue, continue your fantastic work. And Thank I you. wish we will have more of you all through the United States to help these patients. 
I'm actually hoping to start to teach. I partnered with Rutgers for starting in this summer. Um, there are students who want to do specialty affiliations in breast cancer and lymphedema. I'm going to bring three on at a time, have them treating. And it's going to be, I have this, ver I have this vision of like a rotation. I go into each room. I'm working with the patient. I'm working with the therapist. I'm teaching the manual. I'm actually putting my hand over theirs or they're putting it over mine. So I can actually get them to sort of get the feel of what it is that I'm doing, feel the fibrosis, feel the scarring and help them find things like Mondor syndrome and cording. And even if the core, if somebody's complaining that they have a pulling going down their index finger, there's certainly a reason they're complaining of a pulling going down their index finger. They're not insane. They have a pulling going down their index finger. And I bet you if people feel enough, they'd be able to find it. But there are clinics in Manhattan that, and these are hospital clinics where they don't actually do manual therapy at all. They teach self-drainage and self-bandaging. And once they think someone's independent, they discharge them. And I was like, well, that's the most ridiculous. How do you treat someone like that? Because you're not actually getting them to a point where they're even in a self-management stage. You haven't told them other options. And then you're fitting them with a compression sleeve, which honestly compression sleeves need to kind of be revamped, I think. And if we could make them out of a smart fabric and we could start using some of the technologies that exist, then we could actually have a compression sleeve that reacts to what's happening in the extremity on that day so that it doesn't have to be that you're pulling on something that you can hardly get on and they punch themselves in the face. I've done it to people before. Some of these sleeves are just too tight and it's horrifically uncomfortable and they always cause pooling in certain areas. But if it was made out of a fabric that could actually somehow be associated with an app and it would correlate with what is actually in that extremity for the day, then why would we not want to use that technology? There is smart fabric. So if there is smart fabric, then isn't that what we're supposed to do? Like use the things that exist today. So I have all these ideas in my head. The unfortunate thing is I have no knowledge of how to use a smart fabric. I've researched it for 11 years now. I do not understand one word that I read. So I'm sure that you would. I, I don't know. I don't understand it. I wish I did because I would fabricate it myself. I I really think that there are so many opportunities to make people better. And for some reason, we just are falling shy. And like if we could make sleeves better, then people wouldn't have so much backup of protein and so much pitting from 10 centimeters distal to 10 centimeters proximal in their arm because of the elbow crease. Same thing with the leg. If we if we had a garment that could actually react, and even if it had some sort of centripetal force where it gave some sort of vibratory, like something that somebody wouldn't even feel, but we could have something active within that garment, then we'd actually be working to reduce the swelling instead of just having a silicone border at the top that stops everything from moving. So wouldn't that be awesome? I don't know. I just think if we thought outside the box and we were able to have somebody who knew about all of these things, which is not me, I, I'm an idea person. I'm not an executor except for therapy. <laughs> so, But it would be amazing if these things existed, we'd have so many things to offer people. And instead, we keep reinventing the wheel. So we have lots of different companies who make different compression sleeves. They do colors. They do this. They do that. It's flat knit. It's circular knit. But are we really changing the garments that much? Well, I think we yeah. can. Well, I, I, would say... I would love to inter interject. Uh, yeah. Can perhaps in one of the sessions uh, bring slides of ill-fitted garments and, you know, only with little knowledge on lymphology, you would just scratch your head how this is possible that, that a therapist ordered this and that and that and never followed how the patient feels in this. And the patients don't know. They, they are in a pain, but they think that's the way it's supposed to be. So, right. And then the whole entire elbow crease becomes irritated, chafed, the skin peels. It's awful. It's almost... It's it's almost inhumane because you can't just stick someone in something and say, use it. 
Yeah. You have to follow up. You have to see how it feels. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Um, but now I'm not sure how it works with the new Medicare law, because I'm pretty sure you're supposed to order your garments at the same time. It's very difficult. I would say if it's, it's even more difficult. Than it's it worse. Is. Yes, it is. Because you have to send the patient to someone who is measuring and they think that they are better than anybody else and and the patients are ill-fitted. Yes. And there's a lot of facilities that actually wait till the last day of therapy to measure someone for a garment and then they discharge them and call them when the garment is in and none of them fit because they didn't give anyone a management regimen. So then they've already paid for their garment. They go pick it up. They can't get it on. And what did what what did we do for that person? So I think it's so important. And if we don't follow up, even if somebody picks up the phone and calls their patient and says, OK, it's been a week since I gave you your garment. How is it working for you? That's something to do. I call my patients all the time. They text me all night. Is that what I think everybody should do? Absolutely not. I think it was probably one of my worst professional decisions and one of my best. So I have excellent relationships with my patients and I basically have no time for anything else. And yeah, I have a, a little bit of a life and it would be great if I could concentrate. But you know what? I really do love everyone that I treat. So it's not a bad thing. And if everybody followed up, then you wouldn't have people walking around in ill-fitting garments or poorly bandaged because you would make sure that things are going in the right direction. Yeah, and, uh, ab absolutely. I think that the this uh, question of the uh, ill-fitted the uh, compression is is should be really brought maybe much more to the light because the I I think this is our practice all over the world. You see the patient coming so called with the compression therapy, and you see that it's uh, worse than <laughs> that uh, even yeah. no compression. Well, it's sort of like foot binding worked, right? It's the same science. We're binding something and it's making it smaller. But are we really doing what we need to to help the system function? I I am sure that if I wrapped someone's foot the way that people's feet were bound, I could also make their foot like three sizes smaller. But is that what they need? No. no. Is is it appropriate? Is it painful? It must be. I can't imagine. I can't even wear a pair of shoes that's too short for like five seconds. So I can only imagine the agony that that took. But I compare that to the same way that we wrap. If we wrap people and everybody's pulling out the little bit of short stretch that a bandage has, then they're basically suffocating the limb and people are actually in pain. I have patients now who will not allow me to wrap them, even though I know that if I could wrap them for a period of time, I could get their swelling under control because there's an area that needs it. And am I willing to try without 150%? Because if it's something that's never going to happen, then it's something that's never going to happen. I'm not going to force it. We have to figure out how else to make people better. And does it take longer? Sure. But if patients are happier, then they're happier with every ounce of their outcome. Some patients are more afraid of lymphedema than they are of cancer. That's true. And that is really, that is a reflection of the of, of the professionals who are treating patients with lymphedema because that's what they're hearing from their peers who went for the surgery or that's what they're seeing when they look up lymphedema online and they see these pictures of elephantitis. And you do not have to be like that. You can have lymphedema and your arms could look exactly the same or have maybe two centimeters of difference in two spots. And it doesn't mean you don't have lymphedema. It means you're well-managed. That it would be wonderful if everybody was well managed. Yeah, you know, another thing that I would say it's it's such a fascinating conversation. We can always go on for hours and hours. But one of the things that I always bring out, especially for our our younger healthcare providers, is that it's called healthcare, and the key word there is care, yes. not health. First, you have to care. You have to care about people and and then you can care about their health and then you can care about their care and how you treat them and what the outcomes are. And unfortunately, hopefully it's getting better over time and with programs like ours and so many others and conversation and discussion and education. But 
you know, I can remember back to my days in training in surgical general surgery many years ago, and I won't name even the hospital, forget about the surgeon, but I can remember being on a very, very prominent breast surgical um, service in New York City at mm -hmm. a major teaching hospital cancer center and watching the surgeon who is an experienced oncologic surgeon cut right through the nipple areolar complex to take out a centrally located cancer that we were going to do a, a lumpectomy on rather than cutting around the perimeter of the areola in a in a cosmetic way and i was astonished i was i was a resident and i said to him i cannot believe you just did that and he said to me, son, this woman has cancer. She's not concerned with cosmesis. And I said, yes, she is. As we all are. She is. And I, and I thought that that was one of the worst things that I ever witnessed. And I can assure you, even though I was a resident, it, it didn't happen again because I went right to the top about that problem um, because that was not the standard of care in the, in the late 1990s when I was there. That that kind of care, if it was ever the standard, was was gone for thirty to fifty years. Okay, it was just insane behavior. But the philosophy that because the patient has cancer, he or she is not concerned with their appearance or mm -hmm. their their sexuality or their attractiveness or their body or is I think unfortunately that that ignorance is probably still way too pervasive. So I think in some of these patients who are developing lymphedema, even if it may be mild in the opinion of the, of the surgeon who did the operation, it's easy for the surgeon or the primary care physician or the oncologist involved in the case to kind of emotionally and philosophically dismiss that problem because it's not their arm. Right. They say, look, let's focus on what's important here. The margin yeah. are negative, the lymph nodes were negative, you're, you're whatever it is, stage one, you're, you're for all intents and purposes cured. I mean, why are you wasting my time, so to speak, because your hand's a little puffy. Who cares? Right. At Vita Support MD, we believe in creating the best bioflavonoid-based supplements to support your vitality. Bioflavonoids are found in abundance in nature and support excellent health and wellness. The demands and stresses being put on our bodies in these challenging times are unlike any we have seen before. Support your body with the flavonoids it needs to fight inflammation and oxidation. Unlike other products in the marketplace, Vita Support MD dietary supplements use micronized flavonoids for optimal absorption and effectiveness. Micronization is an advanced process which creates an ultra-fine powder easily absorbed by the body. At Vita Support MD, we are passionate about making your good health our life's work. You know, I think that the uh, the uh, Cynthia, uh, the issue that that uh, you are um, uh, signaling also is that if somebody is really well managing the uh, mm -hmm. this, uh, I heard several cases uh, the, that the uh, uh, person is coming for uh, annual visit with the uh, uh, primary care. And the primary care said, you, you don't have lymphedema. Mm -hmm. Of course, no swelling because the, uh, the patient is treated correctly. It's applying everything that they should be. And it's yep. perfect, good, wonderful. We should uh, uh, congratulate the, uh, the therapist. The, the, uh, patients do. the patient's doing so much work. I mean, how do they keep it managed? Yes, it's like to saying to diabetic patient because the uh, uh, the uh, the glycemic uh, levels are correct. You don't have the diabetes. Mm -hmm. Come on, <laughs> right. it it doesn't make any sense. I never understand it. And you know, when people have like, I I don't understand a lot of things that happen. And having worked in the city, I know 
all the hospitals, all the facilities. I never understand why a physician would ever look at a 32 year old woman and say, what difference does it make you look good with clothes on? Do you think that my 32 year old patient cares if she looks good with clothes on? She wants to look good naked. She's not even married. I mean, she, she wants to have her life. She doesn't just want to survive breast cancer. She wants to survive breast cancer and live. And that includes liking what you look like without a shirt on because body dysmorphic disorder exists. A lot of us have it. I mean, for goodness sake, my mother, I mean, I was on the three day diet every three days, I think for like six years when I was a kid and most of it I'm allergic to. So I ate like a cracker and a teaspoon of tuna, but it, it's one of those things that does a woman really want to be told, well, you look good with clothes on. I mean, well, what happens when I don't have clothes on? Because it is awful when you feel horribly about yourself and you feel like you have to be covered. So, and honestly, I'll tell you, I just had colon surgery and I had to get a temporary elastomy and I have it now. And I've never been so miserable with something before. And I actually thought I could handle anything. This is the one thing that I've ever had in my life that I can't stand because I see it. And I find it unattractive, ridiculously. My husband wouldn't even put his hand on my leg. It took me a week to get him to sleep in bed again. I was like, this is ridiculous. You're not even looking at me. So it didn't matter if you couldn't see it with clothes on. He still wasn't getting in bed. So, I mean, you have to understand that there are relationships. There are people who can handle things. There are clearly people who can't. My husband is definitely not wonderful with anything medical. And it bothered him. He was afraid to be in bed with me. He thought he would do something. I don't know exactly what he thought he would do. I'm pretty sure this is about it and I'm at my max. But it is it is a very, it was the first time that I actually had something where I I can understand a lot better where people are coming from because now I know what it's like to appear in sort of a quote unquote deformed fashion. And is it permanent? No, the doctor told me maybe I won't want to reverse it. I think that's insane. I will definitely revert. This is not going to last much longer because I'm not going to last much longer with it. But I would say, don't you think that like now now I know firsthand what it feels like to actually have something that does deform you. And that is horrible. And women with breast cancer, like it is a huge surgery and they do not feel like themselves. So to say you'll look good with clothes on and just dismiss someone is a horrific thing to say to a human being. And the one other thing I've heard someone say is, what do I do? I'm afraid I'm going to get it in the other breast. And the doctor actually says, well, there's nothing more I could do for you. And my patient thought she was just told she was dying. And I was like, no, he meant taking off the other breast isn't going to stop breast cancer. Actually, you only have an 8% chance in that breast. Really? Yeah. Like, But you have to sort of talk people off the ledge. And I don't think telling them that it doesn't matter is a great way to do so, because it does matter. It, yeah, everything. It's, terrible. it's a terrible thing to do, and it's a terrible way to practice and communicate. And I want to I want to thank you, Cynthia, for sharing, you know, your personal medical uh, circumstance right now, because it's so important for people to hear that. And we've had so many guests. We've been so blessed and privileged to have so many guests on the program share with us personal stories and, and things like this. And it takes great courage. And I appreciate you doing that because sometimes people think that those of us who are in healthcare, um, we somehow we're superheroes or something and we don't get sick and we're not real people and we don't have health problems and we don't have family members with health problems and people who die who are close to us and, and all these things. And, you know, we do, we obviously do. We're, we're, we're real human beings yeah. like everybody else. And I think it's important for you to, to share that. So thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. share my screen for a moment. I'm going to show another dramatic, I, I've shown this picture before, but I, I like to show it. These, this is a picture. Can, everybody can see that, I suppose. Mm -hmm. This is a patient of Dr. Hawken Borson, who is a colleague and a friend of Emily's who was on the show. And, and this is a surgical case, liposuction for lymphedema of lower extremity, secondary lymphedema. Mm -hmm. 
So the picture all the way to the right is the patient postoperatively, which is which is amazing and incredible, and uh, you know I think extraordinary. Putting that aside for a moment, look at image one to the center image. Mm -hmm. That patient was just hands-on therapy, compression, wrapping, et cetera. And most people don't know that these kinds of results are available. So if if a really great center who's really dedicated with a great staff, with great training and great knowledge and a, and a really cooperative patient who's all in, if you can get this kind of dramatic result just with conservative therapy, as you're pointing out, imagine mm -hmm. a person who just has, you know, a couple of centimeters of swelling in an upper extremity that's being neglected. Of course, it could it could be made essentially normal with ongoing care. And isn't right. that important? I think it's important. I, I wouldn't want my my hand and my arm to be two centimeters larger on one side if it it's not a, and it's not a female thing or a male thing. We don't have to assign sexuality to this or whatever. Um, you know, everybody wants to look at the best they can with their shirt off. Everybody wants to look the best they can um, when their when their arm is exposed, or they want to wear shorts and their limb is exposed. We all have a sense of of ego and self-image and so forth. And that's normal and that's healthy. But for, for healthcare professionals to sort of tell us we should just let all that go and focus on important things like, you know, you're still alive. Okay, I get it. We're still alive. That is important. But now that I went all the, through all of this to be alive, you want to live your best life. And I think that's where people like you come in. And I'm just going to kind of begin to wrap it up here because we go over these things again and again and again. But I think repetition is the first corollary of education. It's really the mother of education. And I think having you on the program once again points out that we need a multidisciplinary approach to these very difficult problems. You need a surgeon. You need an oncologist. You need a, a, a therapist, whether it's an occupational therapist, physical therapist, uh, lymphatic, uh, uh, certified lymphatic therapist, a physiatrist, you need a nutritionist, dietitian, psychologist, uh, a, a trainer. There are so many people in an ideal world, if we had an infinite amount of money and an infinite amount of time in a perfect system, in a utopian medical system, all of these people would be necessary. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, in too many cases, just about nobody's on the team maybe one or right. two people, and then you're kind of cast back out into the wilderness on your own and and made to feel guilty, embarrassed, ashamed of the fact that you might ask a question about your swollen arm, your swollen leg. I had a friend recently, a guy nearly 70 years old, he went to his urologist and he asked him a question. I mean, if you can imagine this, the guy, my friend called me, he was so upset. He was worried that he had done something wrong. He asked his urologist a question about sexual function and his urologist told him, I don't feel comfortable discussing this. A urologist? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? I, I, I wonder sometimes how this is even possible, but it is possible. So it's like, a surgeon who might tell a patient, "Listen, you don't don't worry about your arm. It's it's okay. It's fine the way that it is. It's not important." And right. it might be an exaggeration that some people might put it in that language, but I can assure you that some people put it just like that. It's not important. You're overreacting. This is not a big deal. This is what they tell people. I see people like that every day in my practice. That they're told by other people. One of my big questions is: They say, "Doctor Chubak." You're saying you can do this, this, and this for me. But I went to the other doctors and two people said there was nothing else they could do for me. How is that possible? I said, there was nothing else they could do for you. That's them on me. Right. Some other ideas. I have some. So I tell patients again and again on this program, if you're not getting compassionate care, if it doesn't seem like the person or people taking care of you, give a damn, quite frankly, go see Find someone else. 
keep keep looking until you find somebody who seems to be interested in you in your you as a person as as emily said earlier dr Eicher said earlier it's so wonderful that you're not just treating the swollen limb you're you're treating the human being you're treating the person as we okay. see we have our wound care people on the program and i love that expression i think Dr. Mark Moline may have taught me that expression a few years ago. You know, don't just treat the hole in the patient, treat the whole patient if you're a wound care specialist, right? Isn't that good? Yeah, I like that. I love that. So don't just so, don't just treat the swollen part of the patient, treat mm-hmm. the whole patient. And that means their mind, their psyche, their emotions, their heart, not their heart pumping blood like me as the cardiac surgeon, the, the heart, like, you know, how they feel, their what they can do about diet, exercise, salt restriction, mm-hmm. elevation, compression, garments, fitting, hands-on therapy, possible surgical techniques. I had a patient I sent her to Boston for, for evaluation for uh, lymphovenous anastomosis, very well-known surgeon. I won't, I won't mention his name. She had testing and whatever. She came back and she says, I don't have lymphedema. I said, you definitely have lymphedema. That's what I do every day for a living. She said, no, I went there to Boston and they did some tests and they said, I don't have lymphedema. So of course I got the chart and I brought her back in. I said, it it says here, you do have lymphedema. It says you're not a candidate for surgical reconstruction, but you see how important communication communication is. And, you know, I mean, the other thing that we can't deny is when people have excess fluid in their extremity, or in their body, they're at risk for cellulitis infections, and they should know what they're at risk for, so that then they can look out for themselves. So if they cut themselves, what they do to prevent infection, and there's a lot of education that goes along with that. And I think when you deny the fact that two centimeters of swelling is swelling, then you're denying the fact that that person needs to learn their precautions for lymphedema. I think everybody post-op needs to learn their precautions for lymphedema and cellulitis because they're still prone. They still have a limited lymphatic function, and it makes so much more sense to just help them. So I teach everyone. I don't say you're definitely going to get a cellulitis infection. I say, listen, if you cut yourself Make sure you clean it. Make sure you either use Neosporin and a Band-Aid. I don't really like Band-Aids because they get a lot of dirt. So I like new skin, but only if it doesn't burn someone because some people's skin can't tolerate it. And so, plus, the fact, plus the fact, remember that when you talk about two centimeters of swelling, you're talking about a, a circumferential measurement. If you mm-hmm. And Monica knows a lot about this subject. She did a lot of research in this area. If you do a volumetric uh examination of that same limb with a two centimeter increase. It's a huge volume increase. If you were going to put two inches on your waist, you'd have to gain 40 pounds. You'd be a lot bigger. <laughs> you know, so so what sounds trivial in some ways is not is not trivial. Well, anyhow, I have to say it has been a wonderful discussion. We'd love to have you back. We're, we've definitely gone a bit over time, but it's been well worth it. And um, I'm going to ask Emily and Monica if they have any last thoughts or, or questions for Cynthia Schechter. And then we'll, unfortunately, sadly, we'll have to wrap it up for this episode. Go ahead, Monica. Yeah, I, I just have the question. In the ideal world, um, uh, with your experience after for women after the breast cancer surgery, mm-hmm. what the follow-up after surgery? Just briefly, you know, like in steps. Steps to follow up? I think initially at least, I usually see people, well, in the city, I saw people who still had drains. I thought that was the best time for me to evaluate them because they were very early on post-op. So, but in New Jersey, for some reason, I don't get a lot of people until they're about six weeks post, which, okay, fine. As far as, what to do with those people. I have um, a lot of educational materials that I supply day one. Um, Some of them are articles on lymphedema. Some of it is articles on just breast cancer. Some of it is about the effects of hormone blockers. What happens if you drink and you have lymphedema? What are these side effects? Um, Eating and lymphedema, um, 
there's there are a lot of different things that have been written up by many different clinicians or even people who just experiencing lymphedema and they're really really helpful um most people aren't going to give anything up completely Dr. Schubach said they don't want to, and they're not going to eat a kale salad, and they're not going to give up their glass of red wine. So what do we what do we know about the effects? What do we know about the amount of sugars? Like is white wine versus red wine? What are the tannins? Tannins have a huge impact on somebody's swelling. So I definitely discuss it a little. Am I a nutritionist? No. And if somebody wants to be referred to one, I have people, I have a list. So I I think initially you do girth measurements, you evaluate them, you see how their motion is, you especially look at their posture, particularly now with the microsurgical reconstructions. You really have to look at how people are standing because most of them are here. And if nobody ever brings them back to their normal point, then that's going to be their posture. So they went through all of this trouble and then they still don't appear as themselves. So I think that's probably where I start is posturally because everybody has to move. You definitely have to get the range of motion in their arms. I definitely pay attention to whether somebody's going for radiation or not, because that will impact how quickly I have to get their range of motion back. I was given two visits for one woman and I definitely did not think I was going to get it. And I did. And I and she did. And I was like, my God, you did such a good job. And she was like, no, you did it. I was like, I didn't do it. I don't do anything myself. Everybody, I am your partner in care. So anything that they need, I'll do. They never present with swelling. I still am going to take everybody into the gym and work on their strengthening so that if they were a mountain climber before, they can be one again. I'm going to work on everything because that's what people need. I think everybody should be able to fall on an outstretched arm without initiating a lymphatic dysfunction. I think that the reason that they can is because for years, how many people said don't lift more than five or 10 pounds? Um, If you can't land on your arm, then you're not able to catch yourself. So what are you going to do? Just fall flat on your face? No, you're going to put your arm out. It's reflexive. Your body needs to be ready for that. And that's part of my job. I can't discharge someone in good faith without working on strength because then I shortchanged them. So I think everything's very individual. I'm going to work on what that person shows me they need. But as soon as someone walks in, they're already showing me because one shoulder's up and their body's bent. And, you know, I notice things. I also work on the reconstructed tissue so they don't get a lot of tissue necrosis because it's very reminiscent of having lump. And I think a lot of times patients go back to their plastic surgeons and say, I have a lump. And they say, oh, no, that's just tissue necrosis. Don't worry about it. And then they come back to me and say, well, how do I know that? I'm like, well, because it is tissue necrosis, but I mean, I can't really tell you what it is because I can't see it. Yeah. Shouldn't he see it? Shouldn't he take it out? Shouldn't he this? I, listen, you have to speak to your doctor. There's a reason you picked him. Um, I can't tell you my opinion because it's not going to matter. I'm not a surgeon, but I do think it's worth speaking to your surgeon. And if you don't like the answer, speak to another surgeon. And if you get the same answer, then you get the same answer. If you get a different one, you might want to go to a third person for so that you know which one to do. So I think it, my role changes with every single individual because it just depends on what I'm looking at. Does that make sense? That's perfect. Thank you. Perfect. All right, Paul, I think we got to wrap it. Oh, well, I don't get to hear Emily's question. Oh, you had a question, Emily? I'm sorry. I just wanted to compliment you because in your statement, <laughs> you said living with lymphedema. Well, you know, I live with lymphedema for many decades. I started to think how many decades. <laughs> I, I think so. my motto is embrace lymphedema and then live with lymphedema. Don't put mm-hmm. it down. And I teach the patient the cup is always half full, not half empty. Yes. And, and there is always a beauty, even though we are a little disformed or something, something. But if we can, on the proper treatment, we can have a beautiful life with lymphedema. Yes. And that's my teaching. I'm absolutely amazing. And again, I wish that Thank you would be somewhere on the West Coast as well so we can work together because I'm. We could talk about it. <laughs> overloaded, overloaded. 
and uh, uh, you know uh, we can talk about it we can <laughs> but continue your fantastic work and thank uh, you don't ever retire <laughs> oh god i don't know if i could say that um it's it's interesting though the motto at my practice is raise your arms high live without limits and it's to address that everybody should have full range of motion and be able to live their life without limits despite the fact that they have lymphedema and not everybody knows what my sort of tagline means but once i explain it to someone because people ask me i'm they're like that's brilliant can i do that of course you could do that and then you know it's a very optimistic way to go into therapy so that they know that they're actually going to have an improvement so um i love that but i'm I'm glad that we can all exist with our abnormalities we all still thank you thank you thank you it was a pleasure with all of you all right very good it's been our lymphcast show episode 61 Please visit our website early and often, lymphcastnetwork.com. If you have a question for the doctors, email them to hello at lymphcastnetwork.com. Every episode is available on every podcast platform under the sun, including Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify. We're all over the place and also on YouTube. And let's go around the table and thank everybody. Dr. Chuback, would you have the honors of uh, thanking our special guest tonight? Yes, Cynthia Schechter, thank you so much for being on the Lymphcast podcast. I knew it was going to be a special episode, and we'll certainly have to have you back in the in the future. Your passion uh, comes through, and your dedication to clinical ex- excellence and treating each patient as a as an individual and as a unique and special human being is greatly admired and appreciated by us. So thank you, thank you for your participation today. It was an honor, and I would love to come back if ever the chance comes. Absolutely. Great, great information, great show. Let's thank our regular panel from California, Dr. Emily Eicher. Thank you, Dr. Eicher, for everything. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Cynthia, and thank you, wonderful team. Great show. You bet. Great job. From Arizona, Dr. Monica Glovitsky. Thank you, Dr. Glovitsky, for everything. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, uh, the, uh, this wonderful team. Uh, I never have enough of uh, being with all of you and discussing this uh, is such an important issue. So uh, looking forward to the next one. All right. Thank you very much. The founder and owner of this show, also the founder and owner of Vita Support MD. They make Vein Formula 1000, Lymphatic Formula 1000. You can get those at Vita Support MD as well as uh, Amazon. Physician, surgeon, entrepreneur, author from New Jersey, Dr. John A. Chuback. Thank you, Dr. Chuback, for everything. Thanks very much, Paul. It was a great program. I look forward to the next one. Absolutely. Again, episode 61 of LymphCast. We'll see you next time for episode 62. Have a great night. Thank you.